was a monumental gaffe that not only revealed what the two most powerful men in the world thought about the Israeli leader, but it gave us an insight into their relationship with the Zionist state. Nicholas Sarkozy called Benjamin Netanyahu a liar, and Barack Obama replied at least he didn't have to deal with him every day. So now we know what they're thinking, but what's your view? Tune into the agenda for another sizzling debate. As far as embarrassing political gaffes go, they don't come much bigger than the recent one involving the US president and the French leader at the last G20 meeting. The two heads of state were gossiping about their dealings with the Israeli leader, and during the exchange, President Nicolas Sarkozy was heard calling him a liar. Instead of defending America's biggest ally, journalists heard Obama respond that at least Sarkozy didn't have to deal with Binyam Netanyahu every day. Neither Sarkozy or Obama were aware that their conversations were being monitored by reporters via the headsets used for simultaneous translations. But some political observers say the off-mic incident speaks volumes about what the West really thinks about Israel, while others say they are disappointed the leaders are not as candid in their dealings with Netanyahu. U.S. election analysts say it is clear Obama has been restraining himself so as not to alienate voters before the 2012 presidential race. But his dislike for Netanyahu is well known and is thought to be mutual. Today's agenda asks the question, are the G20 leaders too afraid to say what they really think about Israel? Well, there are no off-mic moments in this studio, just lots of lively debate, and I'm sure today will be no exception. As usual, we've pulled together a group of panellists with diverse opinions and political backgrounds. First up is Arab media watcher's Sharif Nashashibi, and hopefully he will explain why the world's media sat on the story for so long before an obscure French website revealed all. Joining him is prolific author, Jewish historian and acerbic columnist Jeffrey Alderman, a professor at the University of Buckingham. He thinks the French and American leaders were merely venting their spleen after failing to bully Netanyahu. It's not a view shared by political analyst Ali Al-Kabani, who thinks the furtive conversation reveals just how much control the Zionists have over Washington and the rest of the West. But let's go to Sharif first. Why did it take so long, I think a full 10 days, for that story to come out? I mean, it's a good question because this, who, for whoever broke the story, this would have been a huge scoop. So it is, it, it is very strange that, that it didn't break straight away. It was reported that the journalists in question were French and that maybe the, the, you know, they didn't want to embarrass their leader, so they, they kept quiet. And then it was basically leaked, and then the Israeli media jumped on it. Um, but it certainly is it's strange because, you know, as a journalist, this, you know, any journalist would have known this is going to be a big story, and if I break it first, this is a big uh, scoop for me. Well, and the, the other surprising thing is that when it did hit the media properly, it came and went very quickly. Everyone expected a really big kind of drama about this, and it, it just didn't happen. I mean, when you think about it, uh, the former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown had an off-mic moment in which he referred to an ordinary voter as that dreadful woman... And that argument went on for weeks and weeks. Yeah, and yet this had kind of global implications, and it kind of came and went. And I, I think another surprising thing is that, that you know, you would, you would think that these world leaders have realized by now, if you have a microphone on your lapel, keep quiet if you don't want to say anything that you wouldn't want to be made public. Um, and, you know, the, the, when the journalists were given these translation boxes, they were told not to switch them on until the backroom conversation had finished. Well, that's just an open invitation to switch them on right away. Well, uh, Professor Alderman, I mean, you're also a, a newspaper columnist. You know the media game very well. Uh, why do you think that the journalists were reluctant to reveal this conversation? Uh, I, Yvonne, I don't know. I can only presume that they were sat on. Uh, they were, I understand, French journalists, and uh, pressure was brought to bear on them. Uh, but, 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 of course, the more pressure you bring to bear, the more likely it is that the story will come out in the end. So I think the Sarkozy camp mishandled this very badly. Um, um, so far as Netanyahu is concerned, this was manna from heaven. 
he uh, he because he he now has a lever over both Obama and Sarkozy, and uh, and as as your introduction said, we're we're we're, we're practically in an election year in the USA, so this is not going to do the Democrats any good. So I mean, the the relationship between <clears throat> Obama and uh, Netanyahu has been speculated yeah. about several times. It's not good. It's not. Everybody knows it's not good. Uh, 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 Netanyahu has been the subject of of some deliberate uh, um, slights by uh, Obama and the White House. It's it's well known that the, these two gentlemen do not hit it off. But the French leader, I mean Netanyahu and, and Sarkozy, were close friends when Sarkozy was mayor. They in fact used to have private dinners. Um, do you think that the French leaders? Uh, Outburst calling him a liar would have hurt Netanyahu. Um, I, you know, uh, if you're going to be serious in politics, you have to have a very thick skin. And what's impressed me about Netanyahu, uh, a man of whom I was very critical in his early days, is that he's grown out of this middle-aged adolescence. He has matured considerably in in in, in his present term in office, and. Uh, if he didn't reach this conclusion himself, I'm sure his advisers said, "Bibi, this is a point for us. Do nothing about it." So far as the relationship between Netanyahu and Sarkozy is concerned, well, Netanyahu may, 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 may have learned a lesson here. What puzzles me, however, is what was the lie that Sarkozy implied? Well, not implied, said. Netanyahu had lied about, and I don't know the answer to that question. Well, maybe Ali uh, Al Kabani can tell us because we do know through a, a, a media briefing that Obama gave to journalists in Hawaii recently that the two leaders had been discussing the UNESCO endorsement of Palestine, and uh, Obama had said that he was rather disappointed that the French had supported uh, UNESCO, whereas America hadn't. Why would Netan uh, yes? Why would Netanyahu be called a liar? Uh, you know, Ivan, as you said, Sarkozy and Netanyahu were very close friends uh, before either of them uh, reached power, and they remained friends. But uh, recently, Sarkozy had bad experiences with Netanyahu, and we saw in the last two visits of Netanyahu to Paris, he asked it to have. A, a private audience with uh, Sarkozy on his own, and Sarkozy on the two occasions refused that. And he insisted that the foreign secretary and someone from the Elysee Palace attend the meeting and take minutes of what took place. Uh, but for the whole issue, actually, uh, it was not a shock to anybody, because the whole world knows that Netanyahu is a liar. But the best analysis I read about the whole situation was in yesterday Haaretz Israeli newspaper in which the editor said that Netanyahu is a liar, but he is not the only liar. All previous prime ministers were also liars. And we take example of Eshaq uh, Rabin, who uh, said that he is interested in peace and all that, and he is the one who served the Israeli settlement in the West Bank and Gaza more than anybody else. He said that what Israel considered legal settlement and the illegal post. He built roads to uh, go to this settlement. He protected them and all that. So he said, so both Sarkozy and uh, Barack Obama are not upset because Netanyahu is a liar. It's because he failed to cover up his lies like previous prime minister did. And they he exposed them in front of the Arab world. Well, Mohammed Dwalji went to central London to get the public's view. We've heard the studio. Now let's get uh, what the man in the street is saying. I'm here in central London in Westminster today to ask members of the public what they think about the comments made by Obama and Sarkozy, which they thought were off the record. So let's hear what they had to say. Why do you think Obama and Sarkozy are afraid to tell the Israeli leader what they really actually think? 
Well, you know, I suppose it's just politicians alike trying to... Well, they never tell the, the whole truth, I suppose. I think in private they could, but I don't think it should be public knowledge. I think there should be privacy in leaders' conversation. You can be more candid. And how revealing was the off-the-record conversation between Obama and Sarkozy? Well, I think it shows that all the leaders are run by big business. I think it's, in general, politicians just kind of try to, to kind of shade the truth, so whatever they say it sort of doesn't have any real meaning anyway. I really don't know. I, I don't know what the true feelings are. Uh, they're just a comment that was heard. How do you think Netanyahu reacted when the Israeli press broke the story? I think he's probably having a huge laugh. And how do you think Netanyahu would have reacted to finding out that Sarkozy called him a liar? <laughs> well, I wouldn't have been very happy if I was in his shoes, but uh, it's like I say, they, they never say what they mean and they kind of always try to talk around things. That's why they never get anywhere. That's why everything takes such a long time to, to achieve anything, because nobody really says what they mean. I hope in private he has honest discussions. In public, a lot of things are said that really don't, don't matter. Professor Alderman, any surprises there? And, and also, do you think that Obama and Sarkozy are afraid of Netanyahu? Um, I think Obama is, is, is probably... I think afraid is probably the wrong word. He's wary of Netanyahu. And the reason he's wary of Netanyahu is because of the uh, impact of the Jewish vote in the USA. That's a fact of life. Uh, and, uh, you know, o Obama uh, l last time round got uh, uh, approximately 80% of the Jewish vote. That is a huge uh, proportion of the Jewish vote for the Democrats in, in a presidential election. You'd have but to the do. Jewish vote amounts to less than, what is it, 8% uh, in the, the whole of the, America? Uh, the, 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 that's not the point with respect to Yvonne. The point is it's highly concentrated in those states that return most congressmen and women to Capitol Hill. Um, as for Sarkozy, uh, Sarkozy, uh, I, I, I think this is more complex. Uh, Sarkozy does not, there is a Jewish vote in, in France, but it's more diverse. Sarkozy does not, does not depend on it in that direct sense. Uh, on the other hand, I, 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 I've heard what my colleague here says about the lie that Netanyahu is supposed to have told. I still haven't that, that, that question of mine hasn't been uh, uh, really uh, answered to my satisfaction. But Sarkozy is a man who is very conscious of his own standing, his own standing. And Sarkozy has divined certain things for, or, or, of, a, of a policy nature from the Israeli government, and probably he feels that Netanyahu has not delivered them. Therefore, Sarkozy has lost face. Sharif, I mean, do, do you think that uh, the uh, Sarkozy-Obama uh, set are bullying Netanyahu, or do you think it's the other way around? I mean, what did you get out of this off-mic incident? I mean, for one thing, it, I think the context of the conversation has been somewhat overlooked in relation to the totality of the coverage of this thing. This conversation happened while Obama was telling Sarkozy off for France supporting Palestine's bid at UNESCO. So overall, yes, Obama said, well, at least you don't have to work with them every day. But he was standing off for, for Israel in that conversation overall. So I think people have overlooked that. Um, I think... Um, I think everyone in this equation has a vested interest in not, not making a big deal out of it. Sarkozy, because he was the one who made the, the most embarrassing comment. Obama, because, as Jeffrey said, there's an election coming up and he doesn't want to jeopardize the pro-Israel vote in the U.S. And Netanyahu, I mean, for one thing, Netanyahu almost prides himself on this international isolation. It, it, it somehow gives him domestic support. But also, if you look at it, you know, he doesn't want to bite the hand that feeds him, which is the U.S., and if you look at all three countries have common cause against uh, uh, Iran's nuclear program. And at the moment, um, you have the vote for Palestine as, as uh, Palestinian membership in the UN. Uh, France has said it'll abstain. And Netanyahu may well think, well, I better keep my mouth shut because that abstention might turn into support for Palestine, um, which will be highly symbolic. So I think all three leaders had a vested interest to 
keep them out after this. To bury this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, we don't like burying such things, uh, not on the agenda. I mean, Ali, when the this uh, this moment, this off-mic moment happened, what was your assessment of it? My assessment, actually, that both Sarkozy and Barack Obama are furious and upset from Netanyahu because he is exposing their own policy of supporting him. But why because don't they tell him or challenge him? No, they, they, they don't like Netanyahu, but their policy is 100% support of Israel and the Zionist ideology in the area. So, and we can see that the assistant to Hillary Clinton said, we are not giving charity to Israel. Israel is part of the national security of the United States. So their relation with Israel is above and beyond Netanyahu. That's why I'm saying they are not scared from him. They are not uh, angry from him. They are furious because he's exposing their role in supporting his illegal activities in the occupied territories. And they are supporting him violating all international laws and all resolution. So they would like a prime minister like Ishaq Shamir even, who said that I can negotiate with the Arabs for 20 years in his memoirs and give them nothing at the end. So they don't mind Netanyahu deceiving the Palestinians and the Arabs in general, but they don't like the blunt truth to come that he is not recognizing Oslo agreement and he is not really for peace. I think, Professor Alderman, that you're all in agreement that uh, Netanyahu will just shrug this off. But how is it played domestically? What about the, uh, the Israelis? How do they regard this gaffe? Um, I, my wife and I were in Israel th three weeks ago. Uh, I, I, I think uh, um, Net Netanyahu has a surprising amount of support. So he is surprisingly popular, given his history. Um, look, the, 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 back, the background to this, uh, w w which we need to bear in mind, the larger strategic background, is that there is no peace process at the moment. It's well, let's come back to that. Um, but but at, uh, for this time, we're going to check out the agenda's electronic mailroom to find out what Facebook fans think of the whole open mic saga. Thanks, Yvonne. Well, today's topic produced one big surprise, and that was that none of you were really that surprised by the off-mic incident, which put both Barack Obama and Nicolas Sarkozy in an embarrassing position. However, Palestinian supporter Tuti Atamimi was more surprised by the actions of the journalist who sat on the story until it was leaked. She wrote, knowing that journalists tried not to spread the conversation, I realised that they would do everything to protect Netanyahu. And Raoul Stewart from Cape Town in South Africa said, This faux pas is demonstrative of the fact that these world leaders and their ilk are mere facades and puppets of the new world order. While Sarah Jane Armstrong in the UK observes, Just as two-faced and deceitful as each other. And from New Delhi, one word sums up Altamash Muhammad's view. Hypocrites. And from Sacramento in California, Al Khail states, Cuckolded by Israel, like an angry and frustrated husband who can't do anything but carry her handbag and mop the floors and scrub the toilets. Well, an interesting analogy, but who is holding Netanyahu's handbag, Obama or Sarkozy? And one word from Muhammad Ali summed up his feelings. Spineless, he declared. Muhammad Hassan Didor isn't sure where to begin. He asked, how much can we read into such a small piece of off-cuff remarks by two equally dishonest individuals with so much Muslim blood on their hands? And Pakistani Muhammad Assad was equally dismissive with his question. What can these so-called leaders do but only take orders from their master, Israel? And Paul Sumner wonders if these political leaders can tell the truth, adding, thus highlighting that politicians serve themselves in contrast to the countries they pledge an oath to serve. And Norman Catry concludes, it shows us that we are all being deceived by them and they all are being deceived by someone that is Israel and he is using and controlling them from back of the stage. Ultimately, Israel is the one who will be achieving his aim. Well, that's all we've got time for. Back to you, Yvonne. Well, thanks for that, Mohammed. Now then, we've just got a few minutes to get our guests' concluding remarks. And I'd like to start with you, um, Ali al Kabani, because the, the, the question is, are the G20 leaders 
in particular Obama and Sarkozy, are they afraid of Israel? As I said, they are not afraid of uh, Israel, but they are furious from Netanyahu's policy, which is showing the ugly face of Zionism in the area. Nobody is surprised that Netanyahu lies. All politicians lies. And as Har said, all Israeli prime ministers have been liars. And we can uh, still remember George W. Bush about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and Tony Blair and the 45 minutes attack. So these are liars and they are not embarrassed even when their lies are exposed. But as I said, they are furious from Netanyahu because he is showing their blind support for the illegality and the violation of uh, the Israeli prime minister, the current Israeli prime minister, while others at least went with their uh, conspiracy of trying to talk to the Palestinian and negotiate without giving them anything. Well, Negotiation now for 20 years and they were fr fruitful, fruitless. And as Jeffrey said, the peace process is dead. Well, that, that brings us yeah. nicely on to you, uh, Jeffrey, about the peace process. There is a definite frustration uh, shared by Britain, France and the USA that Netanyahu will not give way on the issue of, of uh, Jewish settlements in Judea and Samaria, which they believe, wrongly in my view, it w w w would lead the way to a peace process. I don't personally believe that, but they do, and they are terribly frustrated about this. And I think this incident that we've been talking about it is a reflection of that frustration. And uh, your view, Sharif? I think this whole issue is not going to affect Netanyahu domestically, but I think what it shows is exasperation by two staunch allies of Netanyahu and Israel, and that, that says a lot. And when you connect that to the Arab Spring, where Israel has basically lost its close ties to Egypt, it has lost its close ties to Turkey, these are cornerstone alliances in the region. And even among its enemies, you know, you have Bashar Assad under threat, and he was at least an enemy that Israel was familiar with. You know, Israel is an increasingly shaky ground regionally and internationally. And I think if you look at the incident in, in, in that wider context, then it holds much more symbolism and should be of concern to, to not just to Netanyahu, but to Israel as a whole. Uh, just very quickly, uh, Jeffrey, going back to the settlements, uh, they are illegal under international law. And does this not just show the exasperation of uh, the likes of Obama well, and Sarkozy? Well, well, let's be very correct about this. They are illegal according to certain interpretations of international law. Uh, on, I, as a, I, as a Jew, have a right to settle in Judea and Samaria under the Treaty of Sebra of 1920. There's no sense in you denying You're that. You're violating the Geneva no. Convention by doing so. Absolutely. Do I have the right as a Muslim to go to Mecca and I claim a homeland right, there? I have the right as a Jew to dwell in Judea and Samaria. No, you, this is your you own can, version. You can at least well, use the legal yeah. names for those We're, countries. West Bank. <laughs> We're coming to the end of uh, the right. show. No, and not there's right. no legal basis or historic yes, there, basis for there that. Is. Article 8. Sorry, That's guys. why the peace Charter. process is dead. That is why. That well, kind of let's, let's do this for another debate. It certainly <laughs> will prove to be a lively one. This just remains for me to say a big thank you to each and every one of our guests, and we'll see you all soon on the next Agenda. Mm -hmm.